I loved Bloodborne. The world of Yharnam, with all of its excruciating grisliness, was my first From Software game and I was immediately enthralled by how much the game felt like survival horror rather than a standard third-person action game. I loved the tantalising lore, the sheer gravity that the gothic architecture and submissive statues give your actions in the world, the quick-fire combat and the twisted monster designs, all of it. I loved it so much. And then I made my girlfriend play it. I hate, I fucking hate this game, honestly. When I made her play Dark Souls, the greatest takeaway was how much she relied on her shield, like a blanket wrapped around her. It, it took a few hours, but she eventually got into a comfortable routine and ended up reluctantly respecting its systems. And I did promise that if you liked that video, I would make her try another title. So what better game to line up next than Bloodborne, one of my favourites of all time? This was a mistake. What you're about to see is the result of 10 hours of gameplay split over numerous play sessions, filled with a lot of anger, confusion, ranting, and many, many, many deaths. The rules were simple. 1. She could take as long as she liked, but the goal was to battle the Cleric Beast. 2. I wouldn't play any of the game for her, she was entirely on her own. And 3. I wouldn't be a backseat gamer. So, let's put these relentless systems to the test. Let's force a noob, a non-gamer, my girlfriend, to sit down and try to tackle the first section of the game. We settled in for a cosy night at home, witnessing a gruelling play session to answer one question. Nubis Humanus. Can my girlfriend make it past the Cleric Beast in Bloodborne? Strong language ahead. childhood, me. <laughs> Bloodborne's character creator is much more detailed than Dark Souls, and the noob has got a real kick out of experimenting with different looks and feels for her hunter. Her experience with that game meant that she quickly understood what the main stats meant. It might sound base for a common gamer, but it was already a promising start that she recognised the heart symbol next to vitality and made the choice to pick a class with more health and endurance. She opted for a slim character because, again, she reckoned it would make her harder to hit, but the very slim option would be a bad idea for lifting heavy stuff. That's, Is that your logic? <laughs> That's my logic! Because of the aesthetic of the game, her character, Aeknarf, was designed to look like a goth. We were 10 minutes in, and already the Nubis was embracing Bloodborne's vibe. At least until the monsters appeared. Oh god, what the fuck is that? No. No. no! no! You don't like the messengers? No! They're the messengers! I've always loved how the wolf catching fire as it creeps towards you teaches the player about the importance of flames against the furrier foes. And the Nubis did pick up on this lesson, but it was the messengers which really got under her skin. This was much to her detriment too, because her first impression of them discouraged her from taking the time to read all of their useful messages. Her experience with Dark Souls' difficulty, the darkness of the starting room, and the immediate terror that the opening instills in a player made her more cautious than the game likely would have hoped. She lingered in this stairwell for easily five full minutes, checking that she understood the controls, watching spectres of previous players die in front of her, and summoning the courage to muster forth. Her desperation for a sneak mechanic returned after she saw the werewolf for the first time, feasting on an unsuspecting victim. She tried to find a way around it, but in the end, confrontation was inevitable. Right! Let's fucking go, ya bitch! Okay. Awakening in the hunter's dream, the Nubis's horror continued. Gazing at the abandoned doll, she whispered, What the fuck is that? Before creeping forwards. I will forever be amazed that in Bloodborne's soup of beasts, spiders, brains, and madmen, it's actually the hunter's closest allies, the messengers, and the doll, which upset the Nubis the most. An antagonistic relationship started here. I wouldn't hold out hope of a friendship blossoming any time soon. 
No. With the Nubis's nerves on edge, what followed was a light jog around the hunter's dream. Weaponless and vulnerable, she did explore, but refused to speak to the messengers, desperately trying to offer up a cleaver and a gun for her to use. Again, her lack of awareness of what the UI specifically tried to tell her came back tenfold in Bloodborne. This meant, unfortunately, that she left the hunter's dream confused and with nothing but her bare fists. What? What are you laughing at? What are you laughing at? <laughs> I am not telling you what you need to do. Dashing past the dreaded werewolf and out of Yosefka's clinic, the Nubis didn't realise that she had missed some pivotal equipment, so she ran around with her hands interlocked, two-handing... nothing, but chuffed that her hunter didn't look like a husk post-death like she would have in Dark Souls. Oh, I like how I look, still look pretty though. Like, it's not like... Dark Souls. She dipped her toe into central Yarnum, expecting a weapon to appear any minute now, but instead of equipment, she found an enemy on patrol and gave him a couple of good whacks before embracing the void. The confusion lasted upwards of an easy 30 minutes, but eventually after returning to the hunter's dream and grimly accepting the gifts from the messengers, the Nubis equipped herself with the saw cleaver and pistol and conquered the werewolf. With a renewed sense of vigour and determination, she was ready to face Yarnum for real. Okay. I don't wanna. I don't wanna. Her strategy, at first, was all about range. Discovering that her weapon could evolve opened up a lot of possibilities to her, but the Nubis's greatest obstacle while playing Bloodborne was that she was still in a Dark Souls mindset. Whittle enemies down. Keep your distance. Don't be too aggressive. She kept referring to her blood echoes as souls, and her timidness with enemies followed her through the first couple of hours. Where are you going, man? Are you still... <laughs> <laughs> the absolute confusion! This has to be one of my favourite moments during the challenge. At first, the Nubis asked, Can I jump in this game? Before realising that there was a lever sitting idly next to this ladder. Cue five full minutes of her stumped face as she tried to figure out how levers worked. She tried hitting it, she decided that the lever was broken so abandoned it, she fought some guys, she found an item but didn't understand why she couldn't reach it, learned to roll, eventually went back to the lever, and in a moment of constipated silence, she realised she had to stand in front of it to interact with it. As she scaled the ladder and drank in Yarnum's lavish architecture and stupendous size, there was an ear-splitting sound. You hear the cleric beast screaming in rage and pain long before you see him, and this is effectively setting up a relationship between the player and their first boss. You're either filled with dread or a morbid curiosity at what creature could make such an ominous sound. The Nubis, well... <laughs> No, 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 no. But she reached the lamp and quickly made friends with Gilbert, relieved to hear a voice that wasn't insane or laughing. She was legitimately concerned about his little coughing fit, but as players of the game will know, that kind of compassion won't get you anywhere. Oh, Buzz, I hope you get well soon. Covid's a bitch. The infamous bonfire mob is a steep learning curve for the game to throw at a player less than 30 minutes in. Up until now, the Nubis had only really faced one or two enemies at a time, but the path to the next shortcut is a long and arduous one, littered with ambushes, patrols, and jump scares. Yeah, I get, I get it. It's fucking Bloodborne. <laughs> but say what you like, the game does ease the player into handling numerous enemies at once. The Nubis was tense, snappy, unaffected by my praise after a good kill, and her strategy with this next section was, again, to take it slow and steady. She refused to battle numerous enemies at once, instead teasing them out of hiding to give them a smack one at a time. There was a lot of retreating and slow-paced strategizing, relying on pebbles to tantalize the marauders into hunting for her. She would count the enemies and formulate a plan, rather than just sink her teeth into the combat. She wasn't interested in parrying at all, which is fair enough because this massive ambush is designed purely to tutorialize handling numerous enemies all at once, and of course being wary of your surroundings. Unfortunately for the Nubis, she really struggled with handling lots of enemies at one time. The insidious world and sound design meant that when enemies were on top of her, she would just 
Oh my god. 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 No, 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 no. I don't want to die like this. I'm too young to die. Oh my god, no. No, 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 no. I'm doing so well. I'm doing so well. Panic. On her second attempt, she picked up that she could regain health by being more aggressive in her attacks, but this was easier said than done. If she took a blow to the head, she would often retreat to lick her wounds. She became pretty adept at remembering which enemies were faking arrest and which ones were actually dead, but some of the ambushes got her really good. <laughs> Fuck off! Oh god, what are you doing? I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. But the one moment where I saw her fail not with determination or frustration, but dread, was when she saw the bonfire mob waiting in the distance. Oh my god, look at them! <gasps> what you're about to see is the result of one full hour of gameplay. But praise the old blood, she made it through, sadistically saving her nemesis, the gunman, until the very end, securing the area and even taking a moment to enjoy a nice little hero shot. What a badass. She grit her teeth and soldiered on, scaling the stairs to another patrol. We were here for 20 minutes. <laughs> The dogs have been her greatest threat up until now, so she tried to lure them out with pebbles to slay one at a time. Her plan was interrupted though by the wandering troll that she'd purposefully avoided, seeing him as she panicked and made a hasty retreat, but after realising that the troll wasn't going anywhere, she decided to commit to her original plan. Separate the mob, cleave through them one at a time. And to my surprise, this resulted in the best possible outcome. All of the enemies lay, ragged on the cobbles. There was just the troll between her and the bridge. The Nubis still refused to fight him, planning instead to lure him away from the staircase and just make a run for it. She shot him and made a desperate dash, charging up the bridge and nearly colliding with two werewolves waiting ahead. Seeing them, she promptly turned tail and in her panic, still made it to safety. After seeing the beast burned alive back at the start of the game, the Nubis noted that she had a couple of Molotov cocktails in her inventory. She quickly put the link together and decided to lob them at her foes. Oh my God. No. Well, it was worth a shot. In her frustration, she confidently raced past the bonfire mob back to the fountain where the troll awaited her, pursued by a stray horny dog. She made quick work of it and prepared for round two with the patrol at the top of the stairs. No, dog! Oh, ah! oh, oh my god, no! Why? Oh my god, no, 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 no! Her absolute raw determination not to fight the troll became her greatest weakness, so she finally swallowed her reservations and faced it head on. Much to her surprise, she managed to kill it in a real show of skill and was finally ready to face the bridge werewolves once more. By this point, she had played through the bonfire section so much that she knew it like the back of her hand. Understanding patterns and AI pathing, luring enemies out and becoming more... I want to say confident with the combat, but honestly I think it was because of pure blind fury. She made it back to the bridge without issue for one more go. She unloaded her molotovs onto one of the wolves and it died without a sound. She didn't utter a word as his pal launched himself at her, just started breathing really heavily, which I would play you, but unfortunately our mic didn't pick it up. After a tense standoff, this happened. Come on! Come on, you're so close! 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 You're so close. Come on, a fuck! And would you believe that after such success, she was ready to pack it in then and there? She didn't want to see the Cleric Beast. She didn't care about no shortcuts. She had been playing for three hours by this point, about as long as she gave to Dark Souls, and even little wins like this weren't enough. Have I not been through enough? Have I not been through enough? You have been through enough. <laughs> it's fucking relentless is what it is. Mm -hmm. I urged her on, and she snuck into the house on the left. Seeing the looming darkness ahead, she smartly decided to equip her torch. 
even after playing Dark Souls, From Software's finicky inventory system proved to be the ultimate boss for a new player. She rifled through inventory screens on the side of this bridge, vulnerable to attack, and eventually succeeded in lighting her way. Clearing through the house, her forward thinking paid off, because the torch in her hand, she was able to illuminate one of the game's most famous jump scares, the Gatling Gun Wheelie Chair Man. But the Nubis doesn't suffer fools gladly. As he turned towards her, she cut him down without hesitation. Exiting the house, sweet relief and safety was just around the corner. Yeah. <laughs> Unlocking the shortcut, she breathed a much needed sigh of relief and I grinned with pride. She had conquered a first pass at Central Yarnum. Aware of the knowledge that she couldn't level up just yet, the Nubis decided to make the most of her time and explore without resting at the lamp so that enemies wouldn't respawn. She returned to the bridge and I think you might know where this is going. Cutting the troll down, she trotted on and one of the game's greatest dick moves appeared to her. I stand by that the bridge doesn't necessarily look like a boss arena and unlike with Dark Souls, it isn't separated from the world by the iconic white fog. This of course is common across Bloodborne. None of the boss arenas are telegraphed to the player prior to their first fight. It adds to that creeping unease that anything can come for you at any time. You're only safe in the hunter's dream. Oh my fucking god, what's that? Panicking, the Nubis made a steady retreat, but the beast caught up. As it neared, she remained tight-lipped, concentrating, not uttering a single word. She rolled into it and swung blindly, but it knocked her aside. She raced to the end of the bridge and it chased her. She healed a couple of times and desperately tried to roll out of the way, but again, because the beast is so large and its reach is so great, it got close almost immediately. Her frustrations with the camera and the tight space resulted in her launching him for a couple of attacks just to get a feel for it, and the expected happened. The Nubis was weirdly quiet during her first encounter with the Cleric Beast, but upon reawakening in the Hunter's Dream, that Glaswegian rage and distrustfulness bellowed forth when she saw the doll was now standing. Oh no, I don't like it. Oh. And the messengers have more gifts for you. Oh, fucking yay. She did give the doll a chance for all of five minutes and engaged her in some friendly conversation. It seemed like the two of them might bond. The little ones. Oh, uh. But then she realised that the doll was in league with the messengers. What can I say, some people just aren't born to be pals. Using her knowledge from playing Dark Souls, she looked into her inventory to see if she'd picked anything up which would give her blood echoes and used the cold blood dew she picked up to formally level up at last. Again, her experience had blessed her with the knowledge of what a lot of the terminology likely represented, so she upgraded her health. Now she opted to explore and grind to level up some more before round two with the Cleric Beast and eventually found her way into the Yarnum sewers. A cautious journey lay ahead, but when she reached the Spear Huntsman patrolling down below, this is where she began to voice her, let's call it discontent. But she returned, determined to reunite with her blood echoes, and fared much better the second time through, being much more aggressive and staggering the huntsmen and rats before they could take a bite out of her. But this didn't last long. Her third trip into the sewers was more dramatic. She pushed past the two werewolves on the bridge, but they followed her right into the gutter. Oh no. The journey to reclaim her echoes suddenly became a lot more complicated. I tried to coach her into venturing on, claiming that the werewolf had dropped straight down into the waterway and it couldn't hurt her right now. I was wrong. Oh my god, there he is! There he is, there he is, there he is, there he is! She charged back to her ladder and tried to wait it out. She tried to separate the wolf from the huntsman. She tried to shoot at them across the way, but nothing seemed to be working. <laughs> Rogue werewolf. Oh, look at him, he's so pissed. 
With the beast's attention, she raced back to the ladder, but it followed. With it throwing a tantrum at the bottom, she decided to drop down on a couple of platforms and use her knowledge of Dark Souls to take it out with a drop attack, but just as she was about to go in for the kill, it slipped off the edge and fell into the sewers. It watched, and it waited, but luckily the Nubis managed to lose it and instead dropped on an unsuspecting rat which had gobbled up her echoes. She was reunited and ready to soldier on, werewolf be damned. She exacted revenge on the spear huntsman who killed her before, she scooped up some new armour and with a deep breath and a good chunk of echoes, so began the journey out of the sewer. She started by ignoring the writhing corpses, amassed in the middle of this pit. She had one goal and one goal alone. Get the fuck out of the sewers. When she finally made it out, her sense of space had completely vanished. She was lost, and it seemed like the only way ahead was to fight the troll waiting in the distance. Her time in the sewers had been a mixed bag. She had gained, lost, gained, lost, gained again, and lost again a metric crap ton of blood echoes, but she also had new gear and some cold blood due to give her a fighting chance. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. There was a growing confidence and cockiness. But as they say, pride always comes before the fall. <sighs> what followed was stressful. The Nubis was beginning to grow fatigued with her time in Yarnum. Despite the little wins, she was beginning to feel like she was making very little progress in her ultimate goal of taking down the Cleric Beast. Not yet feeling up to the challenge and severely done with the sewers, she decided to keep exploring to grind, level up, and buy some blood vials. Right, I'm gonna face these dudes again. I'm gonna fuck them up. Making it back to the fountain where she battled the troll all of those years ago, she found a strange little summon spot. She could request help from a friend, from a man called Gascoigne, even. Seeing him, she toyed with the idea of bringing him in to give her a hand, and maybe together they could take down the cleric beast. Not a bad idea. The fact that the game did not replenish her healing items really began to take its toll. The Nubis began to feel like she was taking two steps forward and one mighty step back with each run through. She was beginning to miss the Estus Flask. Enemies weren't dropping blood vials at the rate that you would expect, and certainly to her credit, not at the rate I had seen whenever I've played the game. Her frustrations were real, so much so to the point where she accidentally unequipped her weapon and tried to take on a sprightly gentleman with her bare fists. She began to get so annoyed that she was questioning the in-game logic of Yarnum. It seemed like everything was beginning to set her off. He's hiding. How come the werewolves aren't getting you? It didn't make matters any better that when she returned to the hunter's dream to buy blood vials, the doll had vanished. With an already irate Nubis ready to break the controller in half, the sudden shock of seeing the doll visiting a greystone nearly made her lose it. What the fuck is that? What the fuck is that? She's checking her flowers. Oh no. No. No, I know, like everyone says, she's bae. Fucking, that's so creepy. That is creepy as fuck. Ha oh, I don't like it. I don't like it. I don't like it. What are you doing? Where are you going? Welcome home. What is it you no, you're not telling me what you're going to do? Okay, that's fine. She jumped back into it, deciding to use the two trolls nearest her lamp to collect blood echoes and practice fighting larger enemies in advance of the cleric beast. And you know what that means? It's time for a montage. The straw that broke the camel's back was when, after all of this, dying and trying and dying again, this little message popped up, 
telling her that her weapon was at risk so she needed to sell off some of her items and starting equipment to raise enough to repair it. She was getting so annoyed and not in a fun way might I add that I tried to soothe her the only way I knew. Do you want a McFee's baby? I'm thinking of ordering one. But even food couldn't help. With chicken nuggets on the way, the Nubis finally let rip on the game, and it was as she vented her rage and tore apart one of my favourite titles of all time that I began to think that this might be a mistake. I understand steep learning curve? Cool. Like, you can throw 50 guys at me. Cool. But don't expect me to fucking grind. Like, how long have I been playing this? Like, eight hours? Longer, for sure, yeah. But they were approaching the 10 hour mark, easily. Why the fuck do I have to grind after that long? That's ridiculous. And it's there that we stopped. Following our McDonald's, we almost silently agreed that for the good of our relationship, it might be a good idea if A, we called it there, and B, I let her have the bed to herself that night. The journey came to an end, the score sitting at a draw. Nubis won, From Software won. And then after a week passed, on a cold Saturday night, she asked me to bring the mic over again, and picked up the controller. One last go, she said. I'm gonna fuck him up. She gave the beast two practice attempts, and fared pretty well. Taking a deep breath and an even deeper glug of wine, she flexed her muscles and settled in for that one last go. With 10 hours of playtime, 4 hours of grinding, and a week's break, the Nubis amassed 20 blood vials and 10 Molotov cocktails. She raced past the bonfire mob, straight to Gascoigne, and summoned him as backup. She was prepared as she possibly could be for the final showdown. She and Gascoigne cleaved through the enemies together, firm partners on the night of the hunt. The problem was, as we've all noticed while playing, that bringing an ally into battle adds a level of chaos to the combat. The Nubis just wanted to get onto the bridge, but Gascoigne, thirsty for blood, wasn't sated until everything was dead. For fuck's sake, man, let's just leave the troll. Right, come on, can we go now, please? Please, please, we've got other shit to deal with, come on. Like, we've got bigger demons to, like, deal. Like, like, can we go, please? Like, come on, let's go. Let's go, bud. Come on. It's trying to, like, drag a guy away from, like, a fight in a club. Like, come on, man, you made your point. Like, let's go. And unfortunately, this meant that the two werewolves, the troll, and the three ravens between our dynamic duo and the cleric beast whittled Gascoigne's health down to the point where he was likely going to be useless in the final fight. Like, he's so dead. Look at him. He's just hanging on. Like, he's gonna literally charge in there by me. And she was right. Gascoigne lasted a total of 8 seconds in the Cleric Beast battle, doing 0 points of damage and leaving the Nubis alone to fend for herself. With no insight left and resolving that this would be her last attempt, she lobbed her Molotovs at the Cleric Beast, trying to maintain a safe distance. She battled the camera more than the beast itself, trying to keep it focused and trained on her enemy, but utilising her new aggressive tactics to the extreme. For every blow the cleric beast got in, she would take three. When she needed to retreat, she retreated, relying on her thick supply of blood vials. She seemed to be holding her own in the first half of the battle. There's nothing worse with a Soulsborne boss than getting grabbed, and at the height of battle, the Nubis felt the pain of common players, but she soldiered on. Blood vial after blood vial whittled down. Suddenly faced with a boss like this, where there's no trick like with the Asylum or Taurus demons, pushed her skills to the edge. The battle raged and raged until she was down to zero blood vials, and just like in the last video, I'm going to play the final moments in full so you can see how it all ended for yourself. Oh my god! Oh my god, I'm so fucked! What you want? What you want? What is that? I know it's an H. Like, oh, it's one way! I'm not the last fucking part.
40 seconds of that! <laughs> I'm not sure what she said there, but I think she's pretty pumped. <laughs> yes! Fuck! We fucking done it! Yeah! Fuck that clown piece! Fucking yeah! And so she should be. 27 deaths and she's done it. Suck it from software. And that's not even the best part. After all of this, after all of her fiery fury with Bloodborne, she had one more surprise to drop. I'm good. I'm good. So on that, I think, I think, yeah, like more Dark Souls. Okay. Say, like right after this, I'm going to start playing more Dark Souls. More Dark Souls? Be still my beating heart. Well, all right then. You know what? She gave Bloodborne more than a solid try, and if having a hell of a time in Yarnum has made her want to jump back in and try Dark Souls again, properly, I think I can swallow that. So that's where we stand. 2-0 to the Nubis, and she's going to play a bit more Dark Souls off camera. I'm not going to force her into recording her time there. I want to let her just enjoy it without the pressures of all this. But if you are curious, I might be able to talk her into letting us catch a glimpse of Sen's Fortress or maybe Ornstein and Smoke. I know that she's happy to try out the openings of Dark Souls 2, Dark Souls 3, Sekiro, and when I do get my hands on it myself, the PS5 version of Demon Souls, so if there's anything there that you'd like to check out, drop the comment below and let us know. In the meantime, thanks for watching and take care.